talk. All right, thanks, uh, and thanks to everybody for showing up so early, of course, in the morning, although I saw that there was coffee outside, so you expected to pay attention. Okay, so group-based secure computation. Let me start by saying, what do I mean by this? Okay, so here's sort of a philosophical look of the landscape of secure computation approaches. So in, a, in one kind of category, I consider these classical approaches, so things that we, we typically talk about, things like Yao and GMW-based protocols. And uh, so these have been around for, for decades and have really been fine-tuned and optimized in a lot of fantastic ways, a lot of uh, practical systems. Um, but one of the downsides of these is that inherently, both of these approaches, kind of everything in this category, inherently requires communication to grow with the entire circuit size of, of, uh, that you want to jointly compute. Okay, so uh, in, co in comparison with these, uh, in 2009, kind of these breakthrough works in fully homomorphic encryption, we found the first ways of getting secure computation where the, the communication grows asymptotically, not with the circuit size, but just with the, uh, essentially the input and output size as you would want. Uh, so this is fantastic in terms of asymptotic costs. Unfortunately, there's a lot of downsides um, if you actually look at some of the concrete costs here. So this has been around since 2009. There's been tremendous work and, and actually tremendous progress in improved uh, optimizations. But still, essentially what exists now uh, is, is even kind of more expensive in, in, in uh, essentially all the... Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not even going to go into the extremes there. Uh, let's just say there's much to be desired. Okay, and one of the, the negatives that kind of contributes to this, not only from a, a theoretical standpoint, but also in terms of practicality, is that all of these FHE-based constructions, so despite a lot of work in trying to get it based on different assumptions, essentially everything relies on the same narrow window of uh, these noisy encodings based on lattices. Uh, so one of, the, one of the downsides of that is, uh, so as I mentioned, not, not only in terms of we'd like a wider spectrum of things, but because there's a lot of these generic lattice attacks um, that uh, means that you actually have to crank up kind of the security parameters, and this, this contributes also to poor, poor efficiency. Okay, so now kind of shifting to the topic of this talk is going to be kind of a different approach to, to secure computation, and uh, this is kind of one of the things that we, we introduced last year in the crypto result uh, based on what's known as homomorphic secret sharing. Okay, so this is the topic of this talk. And uh, the, in the title of the talk, we refer to this as group-based secure computation. And sort of the reason for this is that for the first time, aside from these lattice-based constructions, we have constructions of homomorphic secret sharing um, based on the discrete log type assumption. And I'll talk a lot about this today. Okay, so what is this homomorphic secret sharing? Uh, this is going to be kind of the central friend of, of ours today. Okay, so this is a, an extension of standard secret sharing. You think about some secret X split into two different parts where we require standard security. So if you just see one of these two different shares, you don't know what the secret X is. Okay, but the homomorphic aspect is that I can locally compute on a single share in a homomorphic fashion. So say that there's some program P that we'd like to evaluate such that these, these outcomes here have an additive reconstruction. Okay, so what does it mean? Again, I have share x0, you have share x1, we locally evaluate and these add together. Okay, so an interesting relaxation that's going to be important for today is what we refer to as delta HSS. And this is essentially homomorphic secret sharing but with some sort of probability of error delta. And this probability has taken over the, the randomness of the share procedure. Okay, and in turn, so we have this probability delta in the error, and we allow the runtime evaluation, uh, the evalu sorry, evaluation runtime to scale also with one over delta. So for example, we're talking about one over, um, one over polynomial probability here. Okay, so in the crypto work from last year, we showed essentially that if you have uh, so two different things. First of all, we gave a construction of delta HSS, which we'll go into more detail later. But it also showed that if you have even delta HSS, this is enough to give you, say, uh, succinct two-party secure computation. And roughly what the framework is, is think about these two parties with some secret inputs. We can run a small size um, generic, say, secure protocol in order to generate these homomorphic secret shares. 
And the bulk of, of uh, sort of the work is going to be done in the locally with homomorphic evaluation. Okay, in the end, we can do some sort of recombination protocol to get the final answer. Okay, so the communication here, I don't have to communicate with respect to the circuit size, but just with respect to input and output size. Okay, uh, good. So, yes, so this has two different results, the construction and this, this con uh, putting it together. Okay, so this, this framework is very interesting, particularly from a theoretical aspect. We can do things like beat the circuit size barrier of, of uh, communication. But this is completely, uh, this is sort of like a, basically as it sat before, it was a very interesting direction, but completely theoretical. And in this work, we try to make strides in a couple different dimensions of pushing, not only kind of seeing what is the best that we can do asymptotically in a theoretical direction, um, but also, can we push this? Can we get this to something that can really be practical? And I think that there's a lot of exciting stuff to be said in that direction. Okay, so we look in particular at three different dimensions of improvement in secure computation here. Uh, the round complexity, the communication, and computation. So the first result, I, I'm going to say, is completely theoretical. Um, but basically, we show that we can get two-round multi-party computation from DDH with uh, a little bit of setup. Okay, and previously this, this result was only known based on learning with errors, these lattice assumptions, or uh, indistinguishability obfuscation. Okay, next, in kind of a different direction, we, we look at improvements of the communication complexity. So first of all, kind of trying to shave off these poly and the security parameter factors, we can really get this communication to just input plus essentially output size and an additive poly lambda. And as one corollary of this, uh, so if you consider the, the specific functionality of trying to generate one-bit OTs, uh, oblivious transfer, then we can actually achieve this. So if you have n of these, with total communication scaling essentially four times n with a low order term. Okay, and previously, if you wanted to get any sort of constant overhead times n, this was only known based on polystretched local pseudorandom generator assumptions or phi hiding. Uh, and, and even in these cases, the constant was significantly larger. Okay, and the third category is, is really kind of treading forward into the, the direction of practicality. And we, we have a lot of different optimizations uh, that when you compare at least to, to the crypto result, we're talking orders of magnitude improvement. Okay, good. So I'm, I'm going to, to try to give you a little bit of a flavor of each of these different directions today. But to do or, in order to do that, I'm going to start with a little bit of a crash course of the crypto paper. Okay, so bear with me here. So in the crypto paper, uh, we gave this construction based on DDH for delta HSS for the class of branching programs. And essentially how we do that is we show how to support two different homomorphic evaluation procedures. Okay, so the first is just addition of two values. Uh, and the second is going to be a restricted form of multiplication. I'm sometimes going to refer to this as RMS uh, multiplication. This is restricted multiplication straight line um, for the class of programs. And what does this allow? This allows me to multiply any of my, any intermediate computation value, V, times an input. Okay, so this is not general circuits because it doesn't allow me to multiply two intermediate computation values. But these together will give me enough for, for branching programs. Okay, uh, ignore this arrow here. <laughs> All right, so at a high level, I'm um, think about three ways to encode a ZQ element, okay? So wh what is ZQ? Here, we're talking about DDH, so let G be some DDH hard group of order, prime order Q, and little g will be a generator everywhere. Okay, so first type of encoding is just going to be taking this value U and raising it as the exponent. Second, Second uh, is a standard additive secret sharing over ZQ. And the third is going to be a form where essentially, so it'll be a pair of group elements, shares, such that the group elements differ in discrete log by the value that's in here, okay? Okay, so first observations about these encodings. Within any one of these levels, if I stay within the same level, I have an additive homomorphism property. You can convince yourself of that. But the second and the special thing that's going to be helpful for us is that there's a natural pairing procedure. Okay, so suppose that I have some level one encoding. I have g to the u, 
both of us do. And then we have across us additive sequentiers of some value v. Okay, then if each of us takes g to the u and raises it by our share of v, this gives me exactly this type of level three encoding of the product. Okay, so essentially the discrete log differs by the product uv. Okay, so now let's see how we're gonna get secret sharing, it's homomorphic. So think about kind of roughly, suppose that as part of the secret shares of a value, I give you level one and level two encodings of my input, okay? And now for the homomorphic evaluation, we're going to maintain the invariant that for any partial computation value, we'll hold additive shares of this value across one another. Okay, so first of all, this holds for the inputs. Now if we want to perform an addition, this follows directly by the additive homomorphism of these additive shares. And now let's see how to do an RMS multiplication. As you may suspect, there's going to be something fishy going on here. Um, so, so suppose now, what do I have? By the invariant, if I have this partial computation value, we're holding additive secret shares of this value. And in addition, each of the inputs, I gave you this extra helper information. This was part of the initial secret sharing itself, which was basically g to the u. Okay, so using this pairing procedure, we can get to these multiplicative, these level three shares of the product. And the question is, how do I get back to additive shares, which we need in order to maintain the invariant to get to the next step? Okay, and this, ta-da, is the share conversion procedure, which is really one of the kind of interesting and, and technical and mysterious parts of this work. Um, so essentially, if I think about taking this cyclic group, G, and flattening it out in terms of different steps of multiplying by the generator. So the fact that we have these shares that differ in the discrete log by, the by some payload, in, in this case, this Z is UV, means that you have some group element, I have some group element that differ on this, this position here by this payload. So how we do the conversion, we say ahead of time, let's share, let's say uh, both have, agree upon, some random sprinkling of special points, these red points here, of the desired density delta. Okay, so now once we get these shares, each of us will just output the distance from whatever this share is in terms of multiplications by the generator to the first special point that you hit. Okay, so as long as there's no special point between us, this will give us exactly what we want. Okay, so here this distance and this distance will differ exactly by this gap z. Okay, so aside from this error probability of delta that we have something inside of here, uh, then we'll get a correct conversion. Okay, so I'm hiding certainly a, a number of things under the rug about this construction. In particular, it's certainly not okay for me to give you g to the u for some secret value u. Um, so what we do in reality is, um, so this g to the u is gonna be replaced by an Elgamal encryption, actually a u, and there's a little bit of machinery that needs to be done to modify this pairing, okay? But a lot of the basic structure is exactly as here. And kind of one of the takeaways is that this share conversion, we're gonna have to run it for every multiplication, RMS multiplication, and you have to run it for where this gap is the value, the multiplied value, and also, once for each of the bits of the, the Elgamal secret key, times that value. Okay, so I'll leave it as a mystery why, but please ask me afterward if you're interested. Okay, so this is a takeaway for later. Good, so, uh, so moving forward, our first result is to, to get two round multi-party computation from DDH. So a little bit of context, um, so certainly, two rounds, at least two rounds, is known to be necessary for se secure computation. And if you're interested just in the regime of, of two parties, then actually there's a lot of sort of simple things that you can do to get to two rounds of, of interaction. And the question becomes interesting when you're looking at the multi-party setting. Okay, and so this is something uh, that we didn't even really know about until much, much more recently. And there's been a sequence of works as achieving two round computation under various assumptions, so uh, LWE and IO. And here, this is sort of an improvement of, of setup. So in this work, 
we, we get something that's a little bit weaker than these, the more recent versions here. The difference is this is a common random string versus we require public key infrastructure. Uh, and also we have a limitation on the number, a constant number of parties. But the punchline here is that even when you look at these restrictions, anything here with two rounds uh, was not known at all under DDH. So this is what we do. Okay, so for the starting point of this construction, I want to consider a little bit of a generalized version of the, the two-party secure computation slide that you saw from before. So remember before there was this phase where, where two people were running some sort of secure protocol to get shares of the inputs. Now I want to think about, uh, since we need to get to the multi-party setting, I'm going to consider this client-server model. Okay, so in the same way we can, if we had all these clients who actually have inputs, let's temporarily assume that we have two servers to help us. Okay, so, so first we'll run some sort of protocol to get these shares. The servers will do a homomorphic evaluation. So I want to put a little, little bit of a side note here. So if you can homomorphically evaluate the program that you're interested in directly, um, then that's fantastic. At this point, that would mean if, you can uh, if you're interested in computing a branching program. But even for general circuits, this is not a problem because we can essentially use standard tricks of instead homomorphically evaluating uh, randomized encoding. So you could think of it basically, if I have some uh, very deep circuit, I can squash this down into a Yao garbling, for example, of the circuit. Okay, so say we have this homomorphic evaluation and recall that this gives us the property that aside from some error parameter uh, delta, that these shares will add to the correct output. Okay, so we can deal with correctness in terms of uh, multi like iterating this many times. Okay, but if you, if you stop right here, then this would actually give you a security issue. And the reason is that if I exchange these shares, so some of them have errors, and the error is going to be dependent on the inputs. Okay, so because of that, you have to sort of clean up and hide where the errors occurred, so there's an additional protocol uh, to output the correct value. Okay, so what do we have in terms of rounds? So, oops, uh, no, no, wrong direction. So we have a constant number of rounds, but it's sort of a, a large constant. So to get to two rounds, there's three primary steps. So first, we have to clean up this first step to make it so that you can run just in a single round. And this is where the public key infrastructure is going to take place. In step two, we're going to remove the need for this majority, this extra MPC, by making it so it's safe to just exchange the shares, even though there's going to reveal where the errors occurred. Okay, and step three is going to be to, to support not just two servers, you can essentially think about this client-server model as a, as a setting multi-party computation, but you're assuming that two of the parties, uh, at least one of those two is honest. So we need to extend this to more servers. Okay, so I'm not gonna talk about step one or step two at all. Basically, step one really uses homomorphisms of El Gamal in a careful way. In step three, you can execute with more servers by using sort of standard server emulation tricks. Okay, so for step two, to give you a little bit of a flavor, um, again, the issue is that I can't just exchange the, the homomorphic evaluated shares because there'll be errors and this leaks information on the inputs. And the, the input, uh, so what is it that it actually leaks? Well, remember the probability of error occurred if there was uh, a red point between us, okay? But for example, if we're secret sharing a value of zero, then there is no space between us. So exactly what this is gonna to correspond to is the, the error is directly of a function of this intermediate computation value. And we can show that essentially, uh, so this, this is exactly the sort of setting um, where we have solutions for leakage resilient uh, circuit compilers. Okay, so basically instead of evaluating the standard circuit itself, I'm going to evaluate one that's leakage resilient with respect to partial information leakage. Okay, so this is kind of the, the first part. And the real challenge, or an additional challenge, so if you remember from the takeaway slide, I not only run this share conversion procedure on the partial computation values, but also on the bits of this El Gamal secret key times the computation values. Okay, so 
we have to address this leakage as well, and we do so by kind of adding these uh, additional randomization and secret sharing tricks. Okay, and um, so again, I, I'm just trying to kind of give you a flavor of, of each of these directions. So in the second direction for optimizing communication, uh, I want to give you kind of a, a little clean, I think it's a bit of a cute takeaway here, of uh, the notion of punctured OT. Okay, so for standard oblivious transfer, you think about some sort of large database, and the receiver is interested, say, in one position of the database. But what if you have a, a receiver who's interested in almost all of the positions of the database? Okay, so we give, uh, as one of our techniques, we give basically a cheap protocol for achieving this almost all oblivious transfer via punctured PRFs, punctured pseudorandom functions. And uh, the protocol is actually quite simple. Basically, you can run a generic procedure, generic MPC, where the output is that the server receives some pseudorandom function key, and the receiver will receive a key that's punctured in the positions that he's not supposed to learn. Okay? So now, given this information, the sender can mask each of these values by the PRF evaluations, send them over, and the, the receiver will be able to reconstruct exactly those positions that were not punctured out. Okay, so we use this, uh, this, this piece as a way of dealing with, with leakage in a cheaper way. Okay, so in the previous, I told you kind of this blow up of leakage resilient compilers and everything, but if I allow you to communicate a little bit more via this process, you can get this much more efficient. Okay, so this is together with a couple additional uh, tricks that we have to introduce. Okay, so finally, I want to give you a flavor of some of the, the concrete optimizations that we have. So as the baseline, what is the cost of this actual homomorphic evaluation? So the cost really comes from multiplication, and there's two different parts to this. The first was this pairing procedure I mentioned, which will correspond to essentially exponentiations in a product over the group. Okay, and the second part is the share conversion procedure. So as I've described, basically, um, order of one over delta kind of an expectation times, you have to do this multiplication by a generator and testing if this is a special point. So let me describe some of the, the optimizations that we have. The first is to consider specific, what we refer to as conversion-friendly groups, uh, say ZP star, where two is a generator of, of the group, and the prime here that you're modding by is very close to a power of two. Okay, so what does this give me? This gives me that each time that I need to do this uh, multiplication, I can essentially shift and then do a small addition. Okay, the second big optimization that we have is redefining what are the distinguished points. What are these red points and how are they defined? Okay, so I'm not going to mention we have uh, a provable optimization that de-randomizes, um, but a heuristic way of looking at this is well, instead of saying, uh, say, uh, some sort of pseudorandom function evaluates to a special value, what if I just say this point, this group element is special if in a certain window of its bit representation, I have all zeros? Okay, and this, if you do this, this allows a lot of um, amortization and huge improvements in, in terms of, of testing, the speed of testing. Okay? Uh, so ultimately, you can get this to, to an average of even less than one machine word per, per um, of these stepping along multiplication. Okay, so uh, kind of the high level, there's tons of, uh, of other optimizations we've considered. Uh, and the bottom line here is that ultimately it seems like compared to FHE, one of the things that we have is that the size uh, is quite promising. And the bottom line in terms of, so this was first kind of done by, by estimates, in, and now in we have a follow-up work actually that's starting to look at implementations. Um, so ultimately, for this RMS homomorphic multiplications, if you want error probability delta, it seems that you can get about 200,000 times delta multiplications per second. Okay, so summing up, uh, we have these three different types of results. Uh, kind of going from, from theoretical down to practical as you go along. And I want to end with a couple open questions. I, th I think really this is kind of a fascinating area uh, for me and, and in general. So uh, first of all, there's a lot of questions even just about this component, this homomorphic secret sharing. 
is there any way that you can go beyond branching programs, say from, from DDH? So we know from uh, learning with errors that you can get HSS, um, but it ends up basically going through fully homomorphic encryption. Uh, are there, so all of the, kind of all the solutions that I've really talked about are for the two-party setting. So not for the, for the MPC, you can extend this to multiple parties, but when you're just looking at, say, the homomorphic secret sharing tool itself, as soon as you go from two to three parties, we know very little. It's kind of embarrassing how big the gap is. Um, and in particular, this is because this conversion, share conversion procedure really relies on the fact that there's two parties. Can you get this from this sort of thing from other assumptions? Uh, for the share conversion, can you get a better error versus run, uh, runtime trade-off? Right now, it's, it's directly inverse proportional. It's not clear if you can do better. Uh, can you try to do some sort of better fault tolerance at the program level? Looking at this two-round MPC from, from DDH, can you remove some of the restrictions that we have? So for example, polynomial number of parties and uh, removing the, the public key infrastructure. And I didn't really talk about it, but I kind of want to push uh, the agenda since I'm here. So I talked mostly about this kind of high-end HSS uh, that can support, say, branching programs and uses public key sorts of tools. But you can actually, we, we've looked a little bit at some more low-end HSS versions, and it turns out you can get some really interesting function classes based just on one-way functions. And uh, so you can get a lot of, there's been some interesting works with, with applications building on top of these. Okay, so there's a lot of questions here. Can you, what can you do? How far can you go? And, uh, and so on. All right, so with this, I will, I will conclude.